Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, episode 315. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, the only podcast that dares to kiss and caress your pulsating flesh, torment and tease wherever it will please. Should you find crass language and adult themes unsettling, listener discretion should keep you from meddling. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by Circlet Press, the world's leading publisher of erotic science fiction and fantasy since 1992. Celebrate the erotic imagination with them at circlet.com. This week I'm taking a page from the Drabblecast and bringing you a set of flash fiction stories published in the Circlet Treasure Chest, an anthology of short, short erotic tales. First up, we have Shapely, written and read by Alicia Goranson. Alicia is a 2006 Lambda Literary finalist for her trans-inclusive novel, Supervillains, but you should really check out her 2012 Parsec Award-winning audio drama, The Mask of Inanna, at aliciagorenson.com. Shapely, by Alicia E. Gorenson. Mandy brought Elspeth to the Vermilion Shore at dusk, a private cove out of sight of the radiant city where they worked. Elspeth glanced around the dunes in the wide ocean for voyeurs or peep bots. She was a chubby girl, lovely in a corset, but self-conscious in anything less than that. Mandy hated to see Elspeth shy away from her reflection. It pained her. On the shoreline, the blobby waves rolled from the water's edge in a slow rhythm. Elspeth saw no machine or visitor waiting for them. So where's the surprise, she said. Look closer. The waves weren't forming peaks, but rose under a film which gave them an odd bounce. When Elspeth reached the shore, she saw the subtle form sculpting the ocean. All along the coast, the water rose and fell in the shape of a mass of breasts, clear and blue as the purified sea sliding around each other. Rounded nipples faced upwards on the lower edges of each of the bosoms. No other shapes appeared under the water. Only the surface formed this curious, rippling texture. I programmed the gelatinites for this last month, Andy said, and kissed Elspeth on the nape of her neck. They've had time to extract the chemicals, so they're safe to ingest. Elspeth grinned. What did you use as the base model? Mandy reached around Elspeth's front and cupped her breasts with a giggle. You what? Elspeth said. That's you. Let me show you. When Elspeth was sure she was alone with her lover, she lifted her arms and let Mandy undress her. While Mandy stripped, Elspeth hurried to the water for a closer look. The rush of the tide lapped the waves around her. Elspeth reached chest-high water, and her own wide breasts floated alongside the shimmering turquoise bosoms. She leaped and splashed, fascinated to see how fast the ocean's surface reformed. She bent down and slurped a watery nipple in her mouth. It gave way under the touch of her tongue, but held its shape around her mouth. It did not taste of gelatin, but the salt of a woman in heat, the sweat of anticipation. Mandy slid in the ocean behind Elspeth. She took her waist and kissed her. Elspeth took a breath and fell forward, releasing her toes grip on the sand and floated supine. Mandy held her gently to keep her from drifting away. The breast waves rushed around Elspeth's skin, and their nipples caressed every inch they touched. More water breasts gathered around Elspeth's foam, keeping their shape under her, teasing her ass and clit. Elspeth turned her head for air to breathe and pant. The ocean surged, its power present but kept in check. Mandy reached under Elspeth to her clit to help her along. She slid fingers into Elspeth and wriggled them as a cephalopod. Elspeth gasped and her body began to thrash. The water breasts fell over and under her, sliding and withdrawing, refusing to behave or conform to sense or logic. Elspeth had to release herself and submit to them. Her body quaked and she screamed underwater, bubbling the breasts on the great mound over her head. Mandy helped Elspeth stand and held her close as the ocean rocked the two of them. The breasts Elspeth had found flat and lumpy on herself 
were majestic and daunting when worn by the sea. She, too, was a storm surge, a reflection of the waves, and walked with Mandy, topless, all the way home. Music by Psychotropic Circle. Our next story is Intergalactic Sex Position by Cesar Sanchez Zapata. This author navigates two distinct worlds, one of law and the other eroticism, but his truest passion is conjuring prurient fantasies of erotic bliss, the dirtier the better. The story is read for us by Wilson Fowley, a talented narrator who has read for Crime City Central, Escape Pod, and Pseudopod. Intergalactic Sex Position by Cesar Sanchez Zapata The scouting vessels were never detected. The gang was too busy on the pool trying to hustle into girls' pants to notice any road. Theorists speculate they were miniature pods, though, without yoke or rudders, manoeuvred psychokinetically, roughly the length of a prepubescent child. Meaning they could have flown right over me bleeding head while I was banging some lass and I'd have been none too impressed. But the mothership gargantuan was the word thrown about to describe it in the papers, broke through Earth's atmosphere on what's since been estimated to be their sixth day. That night, Ayanna gave me the go to be her first. Around these parts, everyone was arse over elbows about the one called Miracle on Dorset Street, only virgin this side of Brushfield, except she was really from Banglatown. Brick Lane, that is. This is it. We've had it. Judgment Day, end of the world. I oh, don't believe in that, you idiot, she says to me. Yeah, reincarnation, right? Might come back as fungi. Then where'll you be? You really want to go, never having enjoyed the heavenly pleasures of the flesh? I laid it on thick. She was a fit bird, and tighter than any I'd had. She took to it in the end, so I don't regret a bit of subterfuge. In the Spitalfield circle, my feet generated more interest than the ship's giant thrusters that fizzled, or the reversers that kicked in as the space barge set down, finally, upon the grounds of Hyde Park. The trades had a field day with that as well. I imagine most everyone expected New York City, Central Park, not the Royal Parks. After all was said and done, our planet's brains agreed that location was picked as a tribute, a concept procured from a book or almanac. The great Crystal Palace exhibition and all that, yeah? Since a group of them had done naught but peruse the world's oldest libraries, Sinai, Paris, Switzerland, Rome, day and night. For half a day, the barge lay flat on the verdant pastures with its tail in the serpentine, crossing over into Kensington Gardens. The world held its breath. Even the nitwits in the speaker's corner by Marble Arch trapped it up, for once gave the rest of us peace of mind. My mate Duff pointed out how it resembled a dildo, that's a riot now when I think on it. I was not among the fortunate few to climb aboard once the towering doors had come down. That honour was bestowed upon the rich and powerful by the rich and powerful. About it so much has been written, however, I almost feel I was there. There were compartments, see? Tremendous chambers and tiered assortment assigned to categorical aspects of the galaxy. Enclosures replete with registries to different worlds, tangible evidence of further evolutionised life and scientific grandeur, alien governmental structures, utopian economics, giant leaps in technology, advances in medicine and mathematics. One headline read, Happy Ending Problem Solved. Simon scratched his head at that. Could have just gone and seen Big Boobs Rita in the Bordy for a happy ending. Simon had no time for thirtices, convex quadrilaterals, or polygons. A black ball that a hack likened to the size of a toddler's plaything and looked like volcanic rock projected a screen of blinding light when touched, recreated in vivid picture the very formation of our universe. We were privy right, the boys and I. We'd heard the news coverage. Yet on their ninth day, when we came across one of them walking from Canary Wharf, none of that mattered. We'd never seen one up close. Amazing how humanoid they'd become in six days, metamorphosed eyes and noses and fingers, all things lacking at their arrival. I knew they spoke the language of places they inhabited. I'd read they'd learned Cantonese in just three days. 
What about the bobs and all the sex things, mate? Oh, I should be gutted now, wasting a prize opportunity like that. I could have asked anything. But hell, I was bollocks with curiosity. With all the glorious exhibitions within the craft, the discoveries, progresses, breakthroughs, the one that garnered by far the most attention in the telly, radio, the net, was the sex exhibition. It was a bloke stood before us. No doubt of it, he spoke of sex like only a guy could, alien or not. He told us about the human-sized bobs said to be replicas of the pricks of Jack something or other males who stood a measly four feet tall. The three-headed cock of another race of buggers, with a name that sounded like Ayanna's native tongue, next to a holograph depiction of this E.T. chap plunging all three turgid knobs to his three-cunt E.T. gal. A detailed account of these microscopic creatures who literally fucked one another to death. Emollients for natural breast augmentation, elixirs for impotence and penis regeneration. Imagine the social implications. A woman can actually grow a cock. An aroma derived from the female essence of the Therapiniana thereabouts, sealed in a crystalline case, calculated to contain within a single drop a hundred times the potency of human pheromones. Cracking. We are observers, he said. We traverse galaxies, take note, compile data. We are collectors. We reveal findings to each new world we visit. We are teachers, but we do not choose the lesson. We offer solutions to unsolvable problems, hunger, disease and war. We grant knowledge the world desires. He touched his finger to my temple, then my chest, and continued... Your world counts collectively among its greatest desires, the desire to compound earthly desire. Then they simply disappeared. As for the vessel, on the eve of that ninth day, a globule shimmering like an enormous soap bubble formed from its base all the way around. It held nearly an hour, then burst with a sordid squeal like the sound of a woman caught in the most exquisite orgasm, and in a thin white band streaking across the purple skies, the ship was gone. I was busy with Ayanna at the moment. The story about the intergalactic sex show turned her on like a furnace that never stopped burning. The third story is Fruit of Knowledge, written and read by Andrea Trask. Andrea seeks out herself, with adventures through countless worlds, genres, and mediums. Fruit of Knowledge, Seed of Truth by Andrea Trask. Recorded by Andrea Trask. They claimed she tried to kill me and called it poison. I know better. That is how it is in tales. A stepmother is always evil, a queen all the more so, cruel and jealous. Truth be told, I know that she let me learn things from her in secret while we moved through the confines of the story that eternally bound us. I was the very picture of innocence, but while attentions were elsewhere, I crept to the secret room where she cast her spells and stirred her potions, and she knew I watched, leaving the door open for me. There was little enough power in our world for a woman, even a princess, even a sorceress queen. I watched as she created tinctures and salves to make her skin soft and beautiful, and too to make it tingle until she sighed and squirmed. I heard how she called upon creatures of other worlds to tend to her when my father the king found too much else to occupy his royal time. The huntsman she sent into the wood with me was one of her trusted own. He never realized the charm she worked upon him to soften his heart, and free me to the world outside the confines of the castle. I found seven little men, slight and twisted from their stooping in the mine, and they were kind to me. It was with them I stayed, and with them I waited, until she could come to me in disguise, and through the prescribed litany of supposed falsehood, give to me the apple that she'd infused. It made me sleep, and in my sleep they came to me the creatures of the other world that so enjoyed her pleasures without chance of an accidental child, were more than happy to come to me as well. The one that came first returned the most often. So little was solid to him. Eyes that burned like a sunset, 
and a smile like the crescent moon that would follow as, shifted into this dream world between the other world and my own, insubstantial hands slid over me, awakening my dream flesh. I wonder if, perhaps, as the seven little men mourned my fallen form, it did not grow flushed. I am told I was the picture of health. That one part of him was wonderfully solid, though. I was indoctrinated to the sweet joys of coupling without pain. Floating in a world without substance, he pressed to me, enfolded me within the entirety of himself, and slid unhampered between my thighs. I took him in, quite solid there, ceaseless and urgent. I took him, and he took me without reservation. That I was virgin mattered not. That I was princess mattered not. I was woman. That mattered, and we twined, him filling and awakening me to new knowledge in my ensorcelled sleep, teaching me the thousand joys of touch, of taste, even of teeth upon flesh that could not be marked. He was the first to bring me, guiding me through whimpering and shudders to the point of screaming like a wild woman, and then pushing me further, betimes the touch of others joined him upon me and within me. Perhaps my ruby lips were parted for the ghosts of the moans that suffered from me. Perhaps beneath my carefully arranged gown there was a slow love trickle in the dark and hidden nest of my innocent womanhood. It is for the best that they thought me nearly dead, ensconced me in glass upon a bier and guarded me without inspection. How many times did the glass fog from my breath? How many times did my form quiver unnoticed and subside? Hours and days I reveled in the unbridled carnality that should never have been allowed me until I was awakened rudely. The suction of my prince's kiss ripped the delicious bit of apple from my throat, and I lost the taste of the other hymn's shaft between my lips along with it. Awoke I to a gaze desirous and worshipful. I had not met this man, yet he swept me from my bier, bidding me wave farewell to the little men who had watched over me, and I sat upon his lap, borne toward a new castle. I gazed into his eyes, still tasting apple, cheeks flushed with the remembrance of what he'd stolen me from, and shifted slowly with the rhythmic bounce and sway of his horse. It was subtle. After all, I am princess, and not meant to know the effect my form has upon a man. But I knew it, and felt how he stiffened, and then tensed, trying not to stiffen. He could not hide the glint of burning sunset buried deep in his eyes, and while he soothed me and wished vengeance upon my stepmother, I shook my head and smiled. Soon enough I too would become queen, and he the king in my bed, but I would know how to keep him there. For my wedding gift, from my father's kingdom, came the seedling of an apple tree, and I planted it in my private garden. They claimed she tried to kill me, and called it poison. I know better. And there you have it. Links to all the people who participated in this particular podcast can be found on the podcast website, at nobilis.libsyn.com. You can also find phone number, email address, where to find me on Twitter, and stuff like that. If you like what you heard, please do let me know. And if you like these stories, there's a whole lot more like them in the Circlet Treasury Anthology. Using the purchase links on the podcast website not only tells Circlet Press that you enjoy hearing the stories here on Nobilis Erotica, but puts a few dimes in our pockets here, too. You have been listening to the Nobilis Erotica Podcast. The music is Cold Funk by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Incidental music is by Digital Juice. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard.